Do you find that there are patients with questions about their sleep therapy after their initial PAP setup? We created a forum to help with that. The MSC Sleep CPAP community is a private Facebook group providing a collaborative community for ongoing sleep therapy support. Once they join, members are encouraged to share their experiences, ask questions, connect with other group members, participate in polls, and more. In addition, the community features mass product guides offering information about usage, assembly, fitting, cleaning, and more. So, how does a patient join? MSC Sleep patients will receive a link to join the group through email or a team member. After answering a few simple membership questions and agreeing to the community rules, members are approved and can begin contributing their thoughts, answering and asking questions, plus share their opinions with the group. We look forward to continuing to use this social media platform as an additional communication method to stay engaged with MSC sleep patients after they begin their PAP journey. As we wrap up the day, I have the honor of introducing our final sleep presenter, Amber Allen. Studying in the sleep field since 2008, Amber Allen currently serves as the program director to the CAA HEP accredited polysomnographic technology program at Collin College in McKinney, Texas. She was instrumental in building this program from the ground up and its continued development. Prior to joining Collin College, Allen worked as an RPSGT for the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio. Before her career in sleep, Amber was a child prodigy who started college at 14. She graduated summa cum laude with her Bachelor of Arts degree at 19, and she began her post-college career in the music industry in Nashville. Amber Allen then worked for eight years, including appearing on American Idol and as an extra in film and TV projects with some of the biggest names in music. In December 2021, she graduated with an additional degree in cybersecurity and hopes to bridge this education into sleep medicine and other areas of healthcare to make facilities and patient information more secure. Amber Allen has spoken at numerous sleep and respiratory care conferences at the international, national, and state levels. She also currently holds a spot on the BRBT Board of Director as Secretary and Chair of the CSTE Committee. She is passionate about educating students and the public about importance of sleep. This is the last reminder to submit your questions using the Engage tab, as well as your evaluations before the presentation is over. We appreciate Amber Allen's participation in the 22nd Annual Educational Forum with her lecture, What Happens When We Don't Get Good Sleep. Hi, I'm Amber Allen, and I'm going to be diving into what happens when we don't get good sleep. And so really focusing on sleep deprivation and how we can get better sleep. So the learning objectives that I hope to accomplish today is to identify the functions of sleep. I want to discuss the effects of sleep deprivation on physical and cognitive tasks because sleep deprivation really does play a role in how we perform physically and how we think through tasks. And then I'm going to also dive into some sleep hygiene tips on how to combat sleep loss and provide our patients with better sleep. So the first thing I'm going to dive into is what is sleep deprivation? And when we talk about what sleep deprivation is, this is a period of inadequate sleep. And as far as how long that sleep, inadequate sleep is, is it can either be acute where it's one to two days or it could be chronic where it's more prolonged. Adults need about seven to nine hours of sleep per day. And the younger a person is, the actual more sleep that they need. So we can see newborn babies needing up to 18 hours of sleep whereas our teenagers can get away with nine and a quarter hours of sleep. So the older we get, the less sleep need that we have. Um, and if you get less than what your sleep needs are for your particular age, then you have a result of sleep debt. And so with sleep debt, think about it in the same scope as regular debt. The higher that amount of sleep debt is, the more unlikely you are to ever repay it. And so the further down the road that you go, the more days that you don't get sufficient sleep, the more sleep debt that you build up. And a lot of times what we see, especially in our younger generations, like our teenagers, is that they will go and build up this sleep debt during the week, and they can't possibly get enough sleep on the weekends to offset the sleep debt that they had during the week. 
And so excessive daytime sleepiness really is a widespread complaint. A lot of people will come and present to their physicians, to their sleep doctors with that complaint of not getting enough sleep and feeling tired all day long. And it really is a result of us being part of a 24-7 society. Um, when we look at what really revolutionized the way that sleep is, it goes back to an invention called the light bulb. And before the light bulb, people were getting on average about 10 hours of sleep per night. And after the light bulb, that decreased to about 6.9 hours of sleep per night. So when I talk about sleep deprivation, one of the, my favorite things to do is to find photos of celebrities and politicians falling asleep at the most inopportune times. So if you look at my slide here, of course, I've got Mr. Bean, who, of course, is going to provide some comedic relief there. When we're talking about sleep deprivation, he's holding his eyeballs open to stay awake. Um, in the top middle slide there, I have James Franco falling asleep during one of his college classes. Uh, the top right slide uh, picture is uh, Katie Holmes, who fell asleep on the subway. Um, on the bottom left, I have John McCain falling asleep during the State of the Union address. In the bottom middle, I have Morgan Freeman, who fell asleep during an interview while Michael Caine was talking about the movie they were in together. And then uh, and we've got President Biden, when he was still vice president, falling asleep during a political address. Um, so sleep deprivation affects everybody. Um, it doesn't have a rhyme or reason to it. Uh, it affects, you know, celebrities. It affects business folks. And it, per it affects the everyday folks as well. Um, so there is no getting away from it. And a lot of people have this issue. So it is something we will see frequently in the sleep centers. So when we look at um, the brain and how sleep deprivation impacts our memory and our brain function, there are three main functions in memory that we have to take a look at. Um, acquisition is the first one that refers to the introduction of new information to the brain. And then we have consolidation, which represents the processes by which a memory becomes stable. And then we have recall, which refers to the ability to access the information, whether consciously or unconsciously, after it has been stored. And so with these three functions of memory, acquisition and recall happen during wake, whereas memory consolidation takes place during sleep. And we have different types of memories that the brain is processing. Um, so we have declarative memories, which is what we know. This is our fact-based information. And this is going to benefit more from slow-wave sleep. Then we have our procedural uh, memories, which are how to do something. And these are going to benefit more from REM sleep. And then we have working memory, which is affected really the most by sleep deprivation. Working memory is important because it keeps information active for further processing, and it supports higher level cognitive functions such as decision making, reasoning, and episodic memory. And when we look at sleep deprivation and how it affects the brain's aging process, the brain loses about 5% of its weight between the ages of 30 to 80. And so chronic sleep deprivation can actually age the brain about four to seven years. And they have shown in studies where even younger brains, if they're chronically sleep deprived, they're functioning the same way as if we had a healthy elderly patient. Um, and so we're seeing younger folks starting to have this cognitive decline due to sleep deprivation that is really aging their brain significantly. Um, when you're sleep deprived, it is more difficult to retain new information or learn new procedures in the workplace. So it is impacting them as they progress in their careers. And there are different areas of the brain that get impacted by sleep deprivation. The big one is the prefrontal cortex. This is what commands our logical reasoning, and it actually shuts down after 24 hours. And so if you're not getting any sleep after 24 hours, it's going to really affect your judgment calls. So the prefrontal cortex helps to determine what's right, what's wrong, what's real, what's illusion. And so this shutdown pre prevents the release of chemicals that are needed to calm down the fight or flight reflex. So what we see is the amygdala goes into overdrive, and this is our fight or flight mechanism, and it makes you more paranoid. And then we also see the locus ceruleus activated, which this is the oldest part of the brain, which re releases noradrenaline to war ward off imminent threats to survival. So this shutdown of the prefrontal cortex coupled with the activation of the locus ceruleus is a volatile mix. And one of the most interesting studies I saw was they actually had sleep deprivation experiment with college students. 
And in this experiment, they had these college students stay up over 24 hours and they showed them a horror film. And after the horror film, they had an actor come in that was dressed up as the main villain. And because that prefrontal cortex, which tells them what's real versus illusion, could not decipher that this is just an actor, the fight or flight instinct was kicking in for these students and they were running around frantic trying to save their lives Um, because it's that preservation of self that kicks in when they're sleep deprived like that. So it's very interesting how this all factors in. And so we see, especially in our teen generation, where they're having issues with making decisions because not only is the prefrontal cortex shut down, but they're also thinking from the emotional center of their brains. So we're seeing a lot of bad decision-making as a result of sleep deprivation. Other areas of the brain that we look at as as far as sleep deprivation is the frontal lobe, which controls our speech and our creative thinking. So when you are sleep deprived, you are unable to use complex vocabulary or make logical decisions. You tend to slur, stutter, or repeat words because the speech center of the brain shuts down due to the lack of sleep. And then there's the hypothalamus, which regulates our appetite, our expenditure of energy, and the circadian rhythm. And sleep deprivation tends to increase appetite because the body needs energy to stay awake. Because ideally, sleep is what recharges the body. And when you don't have sleep to recharge the body, the body needs an energy source, which becomes food. So increased caloric consumption is a factor in the development of obesity, which if a patient develops obesity, that can lead to sleep apnea, which further disrupts their sleep and it leads to more sleep deprivation. So we get this vicious cycle that starts to appear. And then the parietal lobe is another area that's impacted by sleep deprivation, and that controls your spatial learning which includes remembering how to get to a new location. So if you just moved to a new place or you just started a new job, that parietal lobe is controlling your spatial learning. So if you're sleep deprived, it's going to be harder to learn how to get where you're going. Um, Sleep deprivation damages spatial learning because the new brain cells that are developed from learning won't survive as well. And then the hippocampus is what controls our memory function. And memory loss and attention deficits are due to increased levels of adenosine, which is a sleep promoting agent. So all of these things are factoring together as far as our sleep deprivation and how it impacts our brain. So there's all of these things that are working together that working against us when we are sleep deprived. So why does coffee help? Well, the thing is, is the caffeine component of coffee blocks adenosine, which gives temporary relief to memory impairment um, as a result of the increased adenosine levels. So adenosine is a hormone that actually promotes sleep. And so it also affects memory blocks. Um, So if you have that blocked, you actually will think better. And actually what we see at Google, for example, is they're ones that they will go and have their employees go and drink a cup of coffee in the afternoon during that afternoon slump. They'll drink a cup of coffee and then they encourage them to go take a 20 minute nap in their nap pods. It takes caffeine about 20 to 30 minutes to really kick into your system. And so when they take the 20 minute naps, it gives the caffeine a chance to metabolize in the system. So then when they wake up from the 20 minute naps, the caffeine kicks in and it boosts their productivity. And Google's actually saved billions of dollars in lost productivity by encouraging their employees to do this. Another area that's impacted by sleep deprivation is response time. So slowed reactions, you're going to have a slow response time. So, you know, if you're driving in traffic and somebody cuts you off in traffic, you're less likely to respond in time. You're also poor at making complex decisions, ignoring the irrelevant and communication. And so we see the ability to distinguish what's important also declines. So you can't go and weed out the information that's not important to make decisions. So you get focused on things that aren't really important. And you're more at risk for motor vehicle accidents. And some states have actually enacted drowsy driving laws due to increased accidents in cognition because your cognition at the point of drowsiness is almost like you're drunk. Um, So it is like you have alcohol in your system and you're making decisions the same way a drunk person would. Um, And so the first of these laws that really came into play was Maggie's Law. Um, And Maggie's Law is named for Maggie McDonald, who was a 20-year-old college student who was killed when a truck driver crossed three lanes of traffic and hit her car head on. The driver admitted that he had been awake for over 30 hours and that he had been using stimulant drugs to stay awake. 
And during the trial, the judge did not allow the jury to consider his sleep deprivation when making their decision. And so this truck driver received a suspended jail sentence and only a $200 fine while this girl lost her life. So Maggie's mother lobbied the state of New Jersey to enact a drowsy driving law that was passed in 2003, and now it makes it illegal to drive while knowingly sleep deprived. So now there is jail time associated with being caught while sleep deprived um, and driving. And then there's also much heftier fines that are in um, the five digit uh, range. So you're seeing a lot more um, punishment now if people are going and taking that risk. And then we also see as far as performance, lab studies have shown in terms of performance that being awake for 17 hours was like having a blood alcohol level of 0.05%. Uh, and being awake 24 hours was like having a blood alcohol level of 0 0.10. The legal limit for alcohol is 0 0.08. So 24 hours without sleep is like the same as driving while over the legal limit. So driving drunk. And so that's why we're seeing more states that have enacted drowsy driving laws because the cognition level is equivalent to that of somebody that's got a lot of alcohol in their system. And the other thing is, is that when you're sleep deprived, you're more at risk for having micro sleeps. And what micro sleeps are is they're where your, your eyes are awake, but your brain actually goes to sleep. And so if you're driving, say, 60 miles an hour down a highway and you microsleep for like three seconds, you've gone the full length of a football field while completely asleep. And so you're more at risk for causing an accident um, as a result of this. So microsleeping is really, really uh, something that affects not only in driving, but we also see it affecting our students who are not uh, getting important information in school because they're microsleeping. Uh, so this is another area where sleep deprivation affects. And then have you ever wondered why it's called beauty sleep? Well, the, there are some hormones that I'm going to talk about on the next slide of, of that are regulated during sleep. But the big thing is, is the growth hormone is regulated during sleep. For our kids, the growth hormone is what allows them to grow and develop but for adults, it's actually what repairs our cells. So getting more sleep actually can keep you looking younger because it is repairing those cells that are aging. Um, and so beauty sleep really is um, tied to quality sleep and getting a sufficient amount each night. So the other thing that we look at is hormone regulation. So I mentioned on the previous slide about growth hormone. And so growth hormone, when it's deficient, it leads to weakened bones, sagging skin, increased wrinkles on the forehead and under the eyes, decreased muscle mass, and stunted growth. So growth hormone is tied to N3 sleep. And as we age, we actually do phase out of that stage of sleep. And so that is part of why the aging process takes place. But there are a lot of studies going into how do we preserve N3 sleep and how do we utilize that for benefiting our patients. So um, growth hormones, one of those areas that sleep deprivation really takes a toll on, and especially as kids are developing um, their brains are developing, but also their bodies are developing. So if they're not getting sufficient sleep, it does impact their development. And then insulin's another area that uh, is regulated during sleep. And so sleep deprivation actually leads to higher insulin levels that can lead to type 2 diabetes. So you're more at risk for developing type 2 diabetes if you're sleep deprived. And then we have our appetite hormones. As I mentioned previously, that your body needs either sleep to recharge or it needs an energy source. And in this case, the energy source becomes food. So there's three appetite hormones. There's ghrelin that tells you when to start eating. So I always say ghrelin's like your stomach growling. Um, and so we see ghrelin being increased in sleep deprivation. And then leptin is the hormone that tells you when you're full. And so this is actually decreased in sleep deprivation. So we have ghrelin that's telling you to eat, neat, neat, and you have leptin not telling you when to stop. And so you're going to tend to overeat. 
And then cortisol is also increased as a result of sleep deprivation. And this is your stress hormone that is linked to the accumulation of body fat. So cortisol is going to have you hold on to fat, especially in the stomach region. So you're more likely to develop type uh, central type of obesity as a result of increased cortisol levels. And so with increased obesity, you're more at risk for sleep apnea and sleep apnea further disrupts the sleep, causing more potential for obesity. And we get this vicious cycle that goes on. And then testosterone is another one that is regulated during sleep. Sleep deprivation can actually lead to lower testosterone levels, which can result in male impotence. So sleep has multifunctions to it that a lot of people are not aware of when they're considering, you know, not getting enough sleep, not valuing sleep and making it a priority in their lives. So why do we sleep when we're sick? I love this quote by James Moss that says, if we treated machinery like we treat the human body, there would be breakdowns all the time. And so when you are sleep deprived, you're more at risk for getting sick. You're more likely to catch a cold. You're more likely to you know, catch the flu when you're sick because you're not having your immune system at top notch. And so basically what happens is that if you get sick, your body's first response is to want to go to sleep. You want to be in bed. You want to get rest. And so your body's kind of saying, hey, if you're not going to give me the sleep that I need, I'm going to make you sick and then you're going to get that sleep. So it's kind of this little cycle that goes on um, to repair the body. And another thing that we see is a lot of health risks that are associated with sleep deprivation. So with stroke, um, especially when we look at stroke cases with our sleep apnea patients who you know have the sleep deprivation, one of the things they've found in some of these cases is that these patients have had what are called silent strokes where they've had strokes that are asymptomatic. And so you can see that uh, activity in the brain, and it's not detected until they have a massive stroke later. And so there's been problems that have been going on probably for years that the patient's unaware of because they were asymptomatic, and it could have maybe prevented that major stroke if they had gotten care earlier. Cardiac problems are another thing that we see associated with sleep deprivation. And cardiac problems we see, especially in our sleep apnea patients, you know, the, the fragmentation there, if their heart's not getting a chance to rest during the night, then it's going to keep working in overdrive. And when it works in overdrive, you're more likely to see it weaken out and then start to have cardiac problems. Hypertension is another thing that's associated with sleep deprivation. Obesity, as we talked about in the previous slide with the appetite hormones being out of regulation, that's heavily tied with sleep deprivation. Diabetes because of the insulin regulation being out of whack. Um, and then your weakened immune system, as I talked about, you're, you're more likely to get sick when you're sleep deprived. Pain perception is another one. Like say you get a paper cut. When you're sleep deprived, that paper cut can feel like the most grueling cut that you have because you have a heightened pain perception. So things tend to hurt a lot more when you're sleep deprived. And then body temperature maintenance. Your body temperature tends to be uh, lower when you are sleep deprived. Um, and so you're not regulating your body temperature as well. And then emotional resilience is another area. So think about it. When you're tired, you kind of like grumpy cat here. The worst thing about waking up everything until I sleep again, you tend to have a lot more emotional responses to things. Um, so you're more prone to irritation, tension, sadness. Uh, it does impair your social and emotional skills. It impacts relationships. You're more likely to get in fights with your friends, your family, um, your spouse when you are tired. Um, and so uh, we also see paranoia that's tied to the amygdala being in overdrive. Because as I mentioned, the fight or flight area kicks in when the prefrontal cortex shuts down. So you're more likely to be paranoid about things and hearing things and seeing things. And there's things that'll uh, um, come into play when you're tired. Um, so scientists from the Sleep and Neuroimaging Laboratory at the University of California, Berkeley, showed that sleep deprivation considerably exaggerates how much we anticipate impending emotional events, especially among those who are already highly anxious individuals. So people that have anxiety, when they're sleep deprived, that anxiety gets heightened and they tend to have more emotional responses to things. And what we see is Almost all of our psychiatric conditions have some level of sleep disruption present. 
that factors into their behaviors. And so that is another area where we want to see those patients getting sufficient sleep. Uh, and if they're not, it does heighten their conditions. So I love this graphic because it really dives into the effects of sleep deprivation and really shows what goes on. So we talked about irritability, cognitive impairment. Um, it's harder to learn things and remember things when you're sleep deprived. So we do see uh, patients that have sleep de deprivation having a lot of memory lapses because one of the things that we look at in sleep deprivation is the amount of REM sleep throughout the night. So if a patient's getting about eight hours of sleep, then they're getting about two hours of REM sleep per night. But if you shorten that down to six hours per, of sleep per night, they're maybe getting about 30 minutes of REM sleep during the night. So that's going to affect memory because a lot of the memory processing takes place during REM sleep. And so if they're not getting enough sleep, then they're going to tend to forget things and have trouble learning new things. Um, impaired moral judgment. We talked about that because you've got the amygdala in overdrive. Um, severe yawning. One of the things when you're sleep deprived is your body is tired. And so you're not taking in deep enough breaths to draw in enough oxygen. So the whole yawning mechanism is because you've not taken enough oxygen. So basically a yawn is making you take a very deep breath in. So you're bringing in more oxygen. And so severe yawning is part of that. And so a lot of times when you see somebody yawn, you have that effect of yawning back with them because also your breathing starts to slow in response to watching their breathing slow. And then you have that response to take that deep breath. Um, hallucinations. Again, it's tied to that paranoia and seeing and hearing things that aren't there because of the sleep deprivation. In some people, sleep deprivation doesn't present as tiredness and the yawning and the sluggishness. It actually presents as hyperactivity, especially in our kids. Kids will present with uh, symptoms that are very similar to ADHD. And it's not that they have ADHD. It's just they're sleep deprived and they need better rest. Impaired immune system, I talked about already, type 2 diabetes risk because of the insulin uh, regulation being out of whack. Uh, increased heart rate variability. So you see the slowing and speeding up of the heart, especially if they have sleep apnea, um, that does not allow the heart to get sufficient rest. And so it puts them more at risk for cardiac symptoms um, and risk of heart disease. Um, they need more reaction time. So you don't respond to things as quickly. Your accuracy, especially for our, our sports athletes. Um, I heard a talk one time about a case where one of the Olympic athletes was getting up at like four o'clock in the morning to do practices before school. And a sleep specialist suggested cutting out the before school practices. And they were very nervous about that because she was going to the Olympics. And so they said, just do the after school practices. And what they found is by her getting more sleep, she was having better accuracy in landing the jumps that she was missing um, in her previous practices. Um, so the sleep, getting the sleep and improving the muscle memory really helped with her accuracy in her sport. Uh, other things that we see is tremors and aches. Like I said, the pain perceptions increased. Other things, growth su suppression, because you're not getting enough of the growth hormone released during sleep. Um, the risk of obesity and decreased temperature. So these are all things that are effects of sleep deprivation. Some other additional sleep deprivation risk factors, you're more likely to battle depression and substance abuse when you're sleep deprived. It's been shown that each hour of sleep that's lost is associated with a 38% increased risk of feeling sad or hopeless. So we do see a, a high correlation between sleep deprivation and depression. And a lot of people are on at risk for dependence on sleep and anxiety medications because instead of doing measures as far as sleep hygiene to get better sleep, they're turning to pills or that's what their doctors are prescribing them to deal with their sleep deprivation. And then they get dependent on those and they're 12 times more likely to abuse them, those medications. So instead of correcting the problem, they're just kind of putting a bandaid over the problem by these medications. And so it doesn't help the patient because they're going to either need an increased dose or they're more likely to abuse it and take more than they should. So the importance of sleep, a lot of us can feel like the guy on the left that's me without sleep, but I have seen from working with patients that have sleep deprivation issues that 
getting quality sleep can really make a difference in the quality of life for these patients. And they'll start to look like the guy on the right by following some of the sleep hygiene tips and also getting things like undiagnosed sleep apnea treated and getting on a good treatment plan and following through with that treatment plan, being compliant with that. When we look at the importance of sleep, if you're an average person, about 36% of your life will be spent entirely asleep. So sleep is somewhat important because we spend 4.32 months of the year asleep, or if we live to be 90, we spend about 32 years of our life asleep. So, you know, when you spend about a third of your life asleep, it tells you that there is an importance to sleep. And a lot of people are not getting the sufficient amounts that they need to have a good quality of life. So I want to dive in for the second half of my talk talking about sleep hygiene and how to get better sleep. So when we talk about what sleep hygiene is, this is the conditions and practices that promote continuous and effective sleep because we want to get people to sleep, but we also want to maintain quality sleep throughout the night. And so sleep hygiene is a major problem for many people because they really just don't have the education on it or understanding the role and need of sleep. And so if we get patients better educated on sleep hygiene, they're going to get a better sleep routine at home, and that's going to lead to more hours of sleep and better quality of sleep. And they're going to feel that difference in their everyday lives. So in order to get good sleep, we got to think about the following. we got to think about where you sleep, because if you think about it, when you're out of your environment, especially like people that travel a lot, sleeping in hotels, where you sleep the noise factor, you know, do you have good soundproofing in your, your bedroom? What kind of electronics are in there? Um, what is your sleep environment? That has to be really carefully looked at because that will impact the quality of sleep that you get. When you sleep and how long you sleep, you know, are you going to bed when you're tired? Are you sleeping the right amount of hours for your particular age? What you sleep on, you know, how, how long has it been since you've changed your mattress? You know, I've had patients that have come in the sleep lab and they'll be like, I got a great night's sleep. And then I talked to them about their mattress quality at home and they've been sleeping on the same mattress for 15 years. And it's got this giant crater going on in it because they've been laying in the same spot for all these years. And they come in the sleep lab where they've got this nice, comfortable bed. And of course, they're going to get better sleep because they've got a better sleeping environment. Um, who or what you sleep with, you know, if your spouse is snoring in your ear and right next to you, you're probably not going to get really good sleep. Or if you've got, you know, your dog in the bed with you that's constantly moving throughout the night and waking you up, that's also going to impact your sleep. What you do before bed, you know, are you spending a lot of time on electronics? Are you doing things that stimulate the brain rather than relax the brain into getting into a good uh, night's sleep? And then what you wear to sleep in, you know, are you wearing things that are too hot for you? Um, that's not allowing your body temperature to drop the sufficient amount um, to be able to get into a good condu conducive sleep. Is it comfortable? You know, these are all things that have to be considered before you go to bed in order to be able to get a good night's sleep. So we also have to look at a bedtime bedroom. So the, the key ingredients for a good bedtime bedroom is to have it dark because light delays the onset of melatonin. And with melatonin, melatonin not only gets you to sleep, but it's what keeps you asleep throughout the night. And so it is regulated by light. And so if you're having a lot of blue light exposure right before bed, you're stifling your melatonin production. And so we're seeing people being increasingly dependent on melatonin supplements, which really don't benefit them in the long run because it's keeping their body from producing enough of the real stuff that can make them dependent on those supplements for the rest of their lives. Um, so there are specialized receptors in the retina that respond to light and melatonin release. Then we also want to keep it cool. The ideal temperature for sleep is between 65 to 70 degrees. So if it's too hot in the bedroom or too cold, that can also affect the ability to get quality sleep. And then you want to keep it quiet. Um, so you want to create either white or pink noise to help you fall asleep. If you're one of those ones that cannot fall asleep with it perfectly silent in there, you need something like white noise because white noise is a consistent sound. A lot of people will try to fall asleep with the TV running, with music, but there's fluctuations in the tonality, the sound that will actually trigger the brain to wake up. So it's not going to be a good sleeping environment. 
and then comfortable, you know, having the right mattress and pillow. You know, you really should change out the mattress about every eight years. And then the pillow, you know, you want to change that out even more frequently because it also can build up with dust and mites that will also be kind of gross and not conducive to sleep as well. So you want to make sure that you have a good sleeping environment. And then you have to look at the known sleep disruptors. What are the things that are keeping you from getting a good night's sleep? The first that we see that's often a sleep disruptor is stress. And so how do you deal with stress? How do you work through it? You can manage it with one of the following techniques. You can do imagery, kind of picture yourself on a beach somewhere, relaxing, um, putting yourself into a mental state that is calming, that will be conducive to sleep. Um, deep breathing, taking those deep breaths and, you know, kind of taking slow, deep breaths that really relaxes the body and gets you into good sleep. Um, progressive muscular relaxation, you know, trying to get yourself detensified before you go to bed so that you're calm, comfortable, and can get good sleep. And some relaxation exercises, you know, you can do some yoga techniques, um, you know, relaxation types of, you know, meditation and thoughts. Um, those things can help you to really manage the stress to be able to get into a good steady sleep. Pain is another thing that's known to cause insomnia. And so getting on a good pain management system um, and working with your physician to get comfortable for sleep can really help to improve quality of sleep. And then illness, um, minor illness is a temporary disruption. You know, think about when you get a cold or the flu, um, you know, it does disrupt your sleep. You don't feel like you can get good sleep because you're all congested. So that will be a temporary disruption. But as far as chronic illnesses that are keeping you from sleep, you really need to work with your physician to get on a good um, treatment plan for that so that and, and have the sleep element included as part of that treatment plan. Um, so have your doctor inquiring with the sleep physician working in conjunction, doing some collaborative medicine um, to make sure that your chronic illness is being managed from a sleep perspective as well. Um, nasal congestion, if you're one that deals with a lot of allergies, I mean, I can tell you living in Texas that, you know, my nose goes crazy all the time because we never get cold enough to kill off a lot of our allergens. Um, so things like over-the-counter decongestants, saline washes to clean out the nasal passages so that you can get good quality sleep. Um, antihistamines can dry out your throat and nasal passages, which can actually make sleep worse for you. Um, so, you know, antihistamines during the day might be okay, but try to avoid those right before you go to bed. Um, and then poor air quality. Most people spend about 90% of their, their time indoors. Um, and so if you have poor air quality, you're not controlling the dust, the pet dander, smoke, um, pollen and other allergens that can cause congestion that can cause you to not sleep very well. So working to work with your sleep disruptors, um, that air quality, humidity. If your air is too dry, especially in the winter months when it gets really dry, you really should get a humidifier because uh, humidity should be about 30 to 50 percent inside your home, according to experts, in order to get better quality sleep. And then light, light blocks melatonin, which helps you to get to sleep and stay asleep, as I mentioned. So if you're having, you know, throughout the day, staying in low light, for example, you're actually getting low doses of melatonin released throughout the day, which contributes to why you might feel tired during the day um, because of that little push of that melatonin. And so if you're not getting proper sunlight exposure, and if you spend a lot of time on electronics, your electronic devices emit blue light. Uh, which stifles your melatonin production. So especially if you're on your cell phone, tablets, laptops, TV, right before bed, that does impact your melatonin production. Um, so you do want to keep your bedroom dark. And one of the things that's really the cardinal rule in sleep to really get a good, good sleep is the bedroom should not have any electronic devices and the bedroom should be used for two things only. Sleep and sex, that's it. Um, if you do anything else in there, your, your bedroom should not be your office, your bedroom should not be your entertainment zone. And, and the brain's not gonna associate the bedroom with sleep. 
if you're making it into these other things. So to really get the brain to associate the bedroom with sleep, you got to keep it to the two main purposes for there. So like I said, sleep and sex, that's it. Um, and then noise, like I said, if you can't keep, uh, can't get to sleep in silence, then use white noise because of the consistent sound. You don't want to have anything that fluctuates in tonality and volume. Um, terrible mattress or pillow. Um, if your pillow and mattress is the problem, get a new one. Um, get one that's comfortable. And like I said, mattresses should be replaced every eight years. And it's more so than just the fact that you're going to, you know, kind of have this indentation from you sleeping in the same position all the time, but they also build up with dead skin and dust among other things. So they get pretty gross if you're not taking that effort to change them. And then caffeine, if you're not timing your caffeine the right time, it could take five hours or more to get out of your system. And sometimes we see with some of our older patients, it takes their bodies longer to process caffeine out of the system. And so, you know, depending on what level of caffeine that you had, I, I have listed here several different uh, caffeine content items from a five ounce cup of coffee to decaf coffee. And even decaf coffee has a little bit of caffeine in it. It's not completely void of caffeine. So, you know, people that are drinking decaf coffee thinking they're not getting any caffeine, you're still getting a low dose of caffeine. Um, tea also has caffeine in it a lot of times. Um, chocolate has caffeine in it. Um, colas, pain relievers. Um, so your ibuprofens, for example, have um, some caffeine content to it. And then if anybody's on diet pills, there's caffeine content there. So, you know, if you're not aware that you're, you know, introducing caffeine into your system, it can also impact your ability to be able to sleep. And then bed partner, you know, if the sleep habits or patterns of your bed partner disrupt you, it can be harder to get good sleep. You know, like I said, if you've got your, your bed partner snoring in your ear and you can't, and you're a more of a light sleeper, you're not going to get good quality sleep. So sometimes, you know, getting their sleep problems fixed can actually help your sleep problems. Um, and then pets, you know, as, you know, as much as people like to cuddle with their pets in bed with them, Pets should really not sleep in bed with you because they do move around, they do disrupt your sleep, and they can trigger allergies. Even though you say you may not be allergic to your pet, they may be triggering allergies that you're not aware of. Um, and so they can disrupt your sleep very significantly. So what helps you sleep better? Making sleep a priority. You know, you have to set aside time to sleep and you've got to make it a priority in your day. You know, if you're building your schedule around everything else and sleep's the last priority of the day, you're probably not getting good sleep. Um, and you also need to figure out what is your circadian rhythm. Um, there was an experiment to try to figure out circadian rhythms, and they had a group go camping out in the wilderness, and they took no watches. They just kind of operated based on the sunlight. And they were able to figure out their circadian rhythm. And once your circadian rhythm is figured out, you need to make sure that you stay on a consistent schedule. And that includes during the work week, on the weekends, your vacation time, keeping that consistent schedule will allow your body to be in a rhythm. Um, so for example, my body wants to go to bed at midnight central time, wake up at seven o'clock central time. So that's my seven hours. And when I travel, I find my body adapts to that same schedule. So if I'm on the East Coast time, I'm you know going to bed at one o'clock and waking up at eight o'clock. If I'm on West Coast time, I'm going to shift it back two hours. Um, so, you know, you operate according to your circadian rhythm, then you don't really need to even rely on uh, alarm clocks. Uh, my body will naturally get tired at that time. And if I don't fight it, I go to sleep at that time. And then I always wake up, you know, I have the alarm as a backup, but, you know, most times I don't even need it um, because my body is in a rhythm. So you have to figure out a sleep schedule that allows you to get the recommended hours of sleep. Have some a consistent bed and wake time. And then exercising regularly. Just 30 minutes daily of exercise can really improve your sleep. So it doesn't need to be a significant amount. Just getting that 30 minutes of daily exercise helps to get your sleep in regulation. But you want to also time your exercise at the appropriate times. You should not try to exercise within three hours of bed because then you build up endorphins, which also contribute to poor sleep. Um, so you, ideally, if you can exercise first thing in the morning, you're going to actually get the greatest benefit out of it um, for your day. So 30 minutes first thing in the morning can really make a difference in your quality of sleep. And then create a bedtime routine. 
Have a regular bedtime routine. Plan ahead for bed. Know what your bedtime is. And don't do anything stimulating right before bed. About 30 minutes before your ideal sleep time, you want to do stuff that relaxes you. You want to, you know, not get into anything that's going to stimulate the brain. And if you do stuff that's relaxing, I encourage people to take like a hot shower right before bed. And then if you have your bedroom set to that 65 to 70 um, temperature um, range, then when you take the hot shower and go into the cool bedroom, it actually drops your core body temperature very quickly and actually um, encourages you to go to sleep. So that's something that you can do right before bed. Um, and just keep in mind, you can't change everything in your routine at once. You've probably spent years building up bad habits and it takes a while to break those bad habits. So start with two to three tips, implement them for three to five weeks till they become a regular part of your pattern and then add more and just keep following this pattern until you get optimal sleep. And then turn off all electronics at least 30 minutes before bed. Um, so you shouldn't be checking out your phone or being on your tablet or computer right before bed. Turn those off about 30 minutes. Actually put them in a totally different room. Then they're not even a temptation for you right before bed. And then do something relaxing. Read a relaxing or boring book, but don't read in bed because like I said, you want to associate the bed with sleep. Um, and so if you're reading in bed, you know, you want to read the book in another room, get yourself tired, then go to bed. I already mentioned about taking a hot shower, um, having a decaffeinated cup of hot tea, you know, something that's relaxing for you, sitting in a massage chair, that um, relaxation there from being in the massage chair, doing some yoga stretches, um, relaxation, vis visualization, breathing techniques can help you to relax. Uh, aromatherapy, lavender has actually been shown to make people sleepy. Uh, meditations, prayers, these are all things that you can do right before bed to get you in a relaxing uh, routine. Restrict your caffeine, nicotine, and alcohol before bed. Um, you know, instead, tr eat or drink something healthy that'll make you sleepy. Um, foods with tryptophan are known to make people drowsy. Anytime, you know, you've eaten after a big old Thanksgiving dinner, um, you tend to feel drowsy because there is tryptophan in um, turkey. And then avoid certain foods right before bed because they also can keep you awake. Things like tyramine, that's found in things like eggplant, potatoes, sausage, smoked meat, spinach, sugar, tyrosine, that's found in avocados, bananas, chicken, turkey, lima beans, milk, cheese. Um, yogurt, cottage cheese, peanuts, almonds, sesame seeds, pumpkin seeds, soy products, um, volatile oils that's found in things like garlic, onions, peppers, that's including red, black, and cayenne pepper, uh, chili powders, curry, mustards, mints, um, ginger, turmeric, um, and then fats, you know, eating anything that's a fatty, you know, you don't want to eat fast food right before bed. Um, that's going to also impact um, your, your, your sleep ability. Um, so tyramine and tyrosine are naturally occurring amino acids. They stimulate the body's production of norepinephrine, which is a brain stimulant, and they stimulate the release of adrenaline. Um, so tyramine helps the body support and regulate blood pressure. And so those people that are taking MAOI antidepressants really have to be careful about tyramine intake because the combination of taking that medication and the amino acid can have some dangerous side effects. Um, volatile oils. Um, is an essential oil that contains the odor and flavor of the plant from which it's derived, like I said, things like garlic, onion. Um, it increases digestive system activity, but it can also irritate the digestive tract and cause dis digestive disturbances that can interfere with sleep. And then consuming heavy fatty foods close to bedtime really puts a strain on the digestive system that can interfere with sleep. So it's really harder to digest fats than it is carbohydrates. Um, so these are all things that uh, can affect uh, your ability to get good sleep. And then when we look at sleep hygiene and alcohol, um, good sleep hygiene is important because sleep fragmentation increases upper airway collapsibility. Um, so we see OSA as one of these triggers for sleep fragmentation and making the apnea worse. Um, so alcohol adversely affects OSA because um, it affects upper airway stability. Alcohol is well documented to trigger or worsen snoring, precipitate apnea in snoring, um, and also increase the frequency and duration of apneas in OSA patients. The effect seems to be most pronounced during the first one to two hours after bedtime alcohol consumption. 
And moderate alcohol consumption even six hours before bed can disturb sleep consolidation and make sleep apnea worse. Patients that have OSA that are on CPAP will require higher pressure levels after alcohol consumption. So alcohol also plays an effect on getting good sleep. Alcohol, sometimes people will take alcohol because they feel more drowsy after drinking it. And while it may get you to sleep, it will also fragment your sleep significantly as well. Your bedroom environment, keeping the bedroom cool, dark, and quiet, keeping your TV, tablet, computer, phone out of the bedroom. Bedroom should only be used for the two things I said, sleep or sex. Not, it's not an entertainment center. Um, keep negative emotional energy out of the bedroom. So don't fight with your kids, your spouse, your roommate in your bedroom because you want the brain to associate the bedroom with sleep. Make sure everything that you sleep on is comfortable. Keep your bedroom clean. Um, you know, your bedroom should not look like a storage unit. You shouldn't keep all your junk in your bedroom. Um, clean up your clutter because you want it to not be a stressful environment. Um, and if it's cluttered, it tends to be more of a stressful environment. So why do you want good sleep hygiene? What are the benefits of it? Well, for one, you're going to be in a better mood and have better cognition throughout the day. So I have seen patients that have been chronically sleep deprived. We get them on a treatment um, regimen and they actually, I've seen complete changes of personalities. Um, I had one guy that um, when I first met him, he was a very grumpy kind of guy, kind of reminded me of a grumpy cat. Um, and then as he got on his therapy and got better sleep quality, it was a different person by a year later. It was very happy-go-lucky kind of person bringing everybody cookies. Like you wouldn't believe it was the same person. Um, so sleep hygiene can really affect a patient in a positive way. They're not sleepy or fatigued throughout the day. You have energy to do things. You know, there might have been things that you weren't doing because you were too tired to do it. And now that you're getting better quality sleep, you have the energy to do it. More energy, better alertness. You're you know less likely to have a car accident, have a workplace accident. Um, you're more alert and cognitive with things around you. You tend to remember things better. So fewer memory problems. You concentrate a lot better. So you're more effective in your job. You can get more things done. Um, less anxiety or depression. Um, so you, you tend to you know not have the negative effects because of the sleep deprivation. Stress is a lot easier to manage. You can think through it, manage it better, and you're less likely to get sick. So sleep hygiene does go a long way for the patients that are impacted by it. And a lot of people just don't even realize that they're impacted by sleep deprivation because a lot of people still don't recognize that sleep deprivation is a problem. I think we're going to see a greater awareness because now we're starting to see um, these different sleep apps, especially I, I know with the latest Apple, um, Apple Watch update that it has where it does these sleep trackers that really give you a better picture you know, of what your sleep may be looking like and shows patients that maybe you have a deficiency in your sleep, you're not getting enough sleep and what your quality of sleep may be. One of my favorite quotes from Benjamin Franklin is early to bed, early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. So we're getting good sleep. We're going to be a lot more effective in what we do. We're going to have a better quality of life and we're going to make a difference in those around us. Um, so these are my references and I will now open it up for questions. Thank you, Amber. Uh, welcome audience to the third and final Q&A session for the JSM Educational Forum. My name is Brent Mayberger, Director of Partnerships at Medical Service Company. Joining me live is Miss Amber Allen. Amber, um, terrific presentation. I tell you, with a one-year-old at home, I'm pretty sure I violate every one of those uh, known sleep disruptors. So uh, very informative presentation and appreciate uh, you sharing your expertise. So. Uh, we do have a series of questions that I'll ask you, Amber, and appreciate okay. your feedback. So we'll, we'll dive right in. Amber, if a patient is failing PAP therapy due to non-improvement in excessive daytime sleepiness, what questions should practitioners ask to include in a report back to their physician? So they should ask what the patient's nighttime routines are. So are they sleep, is the excessive daytime sleepiness due to patient behaviors? where they are restricting their sleep, 
Um, is their caffeine in intake? What's the latest point in the day that they're having caffeine? Because caffeine has that half life that could extend into the evening. So, finding out what's the routine, caffeine intake, any kind of stimulant, um, uh, if nicotine, um, looking at what is their behaviors right before bed, you know, are they excessively using electronics. Um, so what are the behaviors first? Um, and then also looking at the PAP therapy downloads to see is that efficient, that pressure level efficient for that patient? Because there are cases where you can get the OSA resolved with the PAP therapy and the patient will still have excessive daytime sleepiness that's still residual. And in those cases, it might be a case where they need to have supplemental modafinil, for example, with their PAP therapy um, in order to combat the sleepiness. Great. Thanks, Amber. And mm -hmm. great segue into my next question. As a shift worker working third shift in the sleep lab, how do you combat sleep deprivation? What's the safest, most natural sleep aid to use on a regular basis? I'm one that tends to stay away from the sleep aids. I look more at patterns and behaviors because if you train your internal clock to operate on that shift, one of the problems that a lot of shift workers run into is they maintain their schedule for their shift work and then they try to revert to a totally different schedule on their days off. And so when you try to go and have your clock bouncing all over the place, it's hard to adapt. And even with the aids, one of the things with the sleep aids is that, you know, especially I try to steer away from things like melatonin and, and any sleep aids because then you become dependent on them. Um, and so if you get the behaviors changed and you start keeping a consistent pattern, having a consistent bedtime, consistent wake time, then your body gets trained to sleep when it's supposed to. Um, so shift workers tend to kind of bounce back and forth, and that's one of the hardest challenges uh, with regulating their sleep. I tell you, Amber, if you need a case study patient for your next presentation, <laughs> I'm volunteering myself because melatonin is part of my bedtime routine. Um, my next question here, Amber, do you believe that improved sleep hygiene should be integrated into PAP setup presentations? And if so, what is the number one tip that our respiratory therapists can include for patients? Absolutely, you want to educate the patients on sleep hygiene because if they're inst instilling good sleep hygiene in conjunction with their PAP therapy, they're going to feel a difference in how their energy levels are, their cognition. So th it should be not something that's separate from that. It should be something that is integrated because if you show the patient what their bedtime behaviors, a lot of people don't realize they have bad bedtime habits. And so if you can retrain those habits and have them on a therapy that's going to you know, help their sleep apnea, they're gonna see the benefits of that right away. Um, but it's gotta be that two-step approach and you don't wanna overwhelm the patient either. You wanna just give them maybe three tips um, to start off with and then once they master those tips, wait about another five weeks or so and give them another three tips to work on. So it's something as you're doing follow-up that patient, okay, how are those sleep hygiene tips working for you? Are you able to integrate them into your nightly routines? Um, and are you seeing a benefit to your sleep from using those, those tips? Thank you, Amber. We have a question here from an audience member. Um, if, if, what is your suggestion if a cool, dark, quiet bedroom isn't an option for getting a good night's sleep? What, what do you do? Well, I mean, you have to look at, you know, if you're not able to fall asleep right away, one of the biggest things is only returning to the bedroom when you're tired. So, you know, if the environment is keeping you from being tired, just get to a point, usually when you're tired enough, you'll sleep through pretty much anything because you'll kind of go into that sleep deprivation of um, rebound sleep that'll go into that deep sleep. And so deep sleep, you sleep through pretty much most things. Um, and so if you only return to the bed when you're tired, um, sometimes you can kind of combat the environmental issues that are around you, but things like, you know, if you don't have the cool dark, you know, things like blackout curtains help, um, things yeah. like, you know, even putting your headphones on with some white noise um, to drown out the external noise that can help um, a fan. You know, those are things that are not very expensive that can help to try to facilitate some of that um, to create an environment that is conducive for sleep. 
Amber, thank you so much. Um, again, uh, just very intriguing presentation. Who knew uh, decaf coffee had caffeine in it, right? So uh, <laughs> definitely learned something today. Thank you so much for your time, Amber, and sharing your expertise. Um, one housekeeping uh, item for everybody that's still joining us. If you failed to attend a portion of the present, any presentation today, uh, those will be uploaded uh, on this event website where you can go in watch the video uh, and complete that survey. Um, those surveys do need to be submitted by end of day today. So uh, if you need to go back and revisit any presentation, please do so. Those will be on the website. Submit the survey by end of day today to get those credits. Um, I just wanna say thank you to all of our sponsors, our partners, um, all the team members that made this event happen and the patients that entrust us with their care. Uh, this events like this wouldn't be possible uh, without all of you. So um, that concludes the Q and A today. Amber, thank you so much, and we will uh, put on a closing video. Safe holiday season to all. Be healthy. Be happy. Thank you. It is my honor to wrap up this day dedicated to professional growth and education. Thank you for spending your day with us. Today, we enjoyed the opportunity to learn from the best in the nation in the sleep and respiratory disease management arena. Those of you earning CEUs from today's event, you can retrieve your certificate by clicking on the account link in the left-hand vertical navigation, scroll to the bottom of the screen until you see attendance certificate, and click request new certificate. Your certificate will detail all earned CEUs. CEUs were earned through the completion of the evaluations for the lectures you attended today. We want your feedback. Today's event means a lot to us, and we want it to bring as much value as possible to you. Please be on the lookout for our email survey in the next few days. We appreciate you taking the time to complete it so you can help us make this event be the best it can be. In closing, a warm thank you to our speakers, our sponsors, and our fellow DME partners. A special note of appreciation to our MSC team members contributing to this event, especially our planning committee led by Karen Tupas and Julie Banez. We could not do this without you. Thank you and see everyone next year. <laughs>